This is a survey of details about free body diagrams that's normally presented over several days in lecture, so this is a rather quick pass through the material. The starting point is to decide if we need to do it in the, at all. Do we need a free body diagram? Do we know all of the forces and or the acceleration as vectors? If yes, then we don't need to draw a free body diagram because we have everything we need to just plug in the vectors in the Newton's second law and solve. If not, we definitely will probably need to do a free body diagram. Is it clear that all of the forces are constant? If yes, keep on going. If no, we probably should check again. Later in the semester, we will be able to handle forces that vary with position using con energy conservation or in one special case of simple harmonic motion. If we're still in the early chapters, four and five, you definitely need to look and see whether or not the, there's something else telling you that the force involved is constant. For example, a spring will provide a constant force if its length is constant. Something in the problem, like a statement that the acceleration is constant, or the acceleration is zero, or that we're using an average force, might be telling you that the forces in the problem actually are constant. Okay, once you've decided you need to do this kind of approach to a problem, some of the forces are defined only by something in the picture, maybe by magnitude or angle, you need to start by making the first of two drawings. You need a drawing of the problem that shows a copy of what's in the diagram in a problem or your interpretation of what the words mean. You should only skip this if you're taking a test or, for example, if you already have a diagram that you can just write on so you can do the, uh, this, this step by writing on another picture. Identify the body, the one body that we're planning to analyze. If there's a second body in the problem, you need to draw a boundary around each one to isolate them from each other so you can analyze them as separate problems. Now begins the real attack on the problem. Identify motion that might be in the problem. Is the body at rest and remaining at rest? If so, we have a case of static equilibrium. The acceleration is zero and the velocity is zero. In this case, the environment will determine the coordinate system we need to use but at least we know all forces are constant from the information given in the problem. Is the body moving at a constant velocity? If the velocity is constant, it's dynamic equilibrium. The acceleration is zero, although the velocity is not. That tells you again that all of the forces are constant and that we will use the environment to determine the coordinate system, although usually the environment might give us an axis that's parallel to the velocity. You want to be paying attention to the velocity and direction of the velocity in this case. Is the body accelerating with a constant acceleration vector? If so, one axis in the free body diagram should be parallel to that acceleration vector. The only exception would be a case where the problem already tells you the vector information and defines the coordinate system for you. And it should go without saying, if the acceleration is not a constant vector, you're doing the problem the wrong way. You need to look at a different situation, a different attack on the problem. But if we have constant acceleration, all the forces are constant, and this is our way of attacking the problem. Next interpretation step, we also have to identify the environment. Is the body hanging in the air? If so, we want to choose a coordinate system with a y-axis that's vertical, parallel to the force of gravity produced by the Earth. Start your analysis with the Earth, drawing the force of gravity acting on the mass as your first step in drawing the free body diagram. Is the body on a surface? Choose a coordinate system with the x-axis parallel to the surface, so the y-axis is perpendicular, the mathematical term for this is normal, to the surface. Start your drawing with the normal force, that is the perpendicular contact force that the surface is applying to the body. Most important thing is to follow a definite procedure. Follow a definite procedure every time. Have a mental checklist to go through these steps. Your process doesn't have to be exactly the one that I'm describing to you. In fact, eventually professors in other classes will teach you procedures and shortcuts specific to your profession. But you need to do all of these things for every problem, even if you only do them in your head, even if you do them in a slightly different sequence in your head as you learn how to do things in your profession. The most common reason for screwing up something, it might be a problem in a class, it might be an actual professional uh, problem like your bridge falls down, your software crashes, is that you forgot to, something on that mental checklist because you hadn't used it freak recently, you hadn't used it frequently enough to make it automatic. Okay. 
we have to identify the environment again. We're not done with that because what makes a free body free is that there are no surfaces in the free body diagram. There are only forces. You have to replace everything in the problem that you might have thought is part of keeping the thing where it is, replacing that thing like a surface with a force. And we must identify every force acting on each body if we're going to get the problem right. The kind of environment we're talking about is the earth, which produces a force of gravity in the down direction, a surface, which produces a normal force. Uh, some notations for that would be F sub n for normal, F perpendicular, indicating that it is perpendicular to the surface, or the symbol n for normal. This is a contact force produced by the surface on the body that is always perpendicular to the surface. Ropes. Tension, sometimes called, usually called T, sometimes called F sub T for tension. Tension is something that pulls in from towards the center from both ends like a stretch spring does. Friction, mu, the coefficient of friction times the normal force. The important thing here is that when it appears in a free body diagram, it must be left as an unknown. Never guess its value. Always determine its value by solving equations. That I can't emphasize enough. Contact with the body, might just call that F. Contact forces like this push away like a compressed spring. And spring forces, negative kx. That force is constant if the length is constant. So if the x is fixed for some reason, that becomes a constant force. If x varies because the spring is moving during the problem, then you do not have a constant force and you have to attack it with a special technique in this level class. Okay, now we get into the developed territory. D for draw. We've already drawn one picture. Now we draw the one that matters, the free body diagram, which solves the problem for you if you do it the way I describe here. Select the body we're going to analyze. Each body gets its own free body diagram. Focus on that one body's environment and then do these steps. Define a coordinate system, draw the forces in terms of their components, and write the equations, and then you can solve them. The coordinate system for one body is one that you should have already chosen from the environment or from the motion of the problem. When you draw it, there are no arrows on the axes. Arrows appear only for forces. Put a dot at the center to represent the body. There's no box or triangle or circle or whatever, just a big black dot. And identify the body with a label in one corner of the free body diagram so you can keep track of which diagram is for which object. If you identified an acceleration or velocity, note this also in the corner of the free body diagram. You don't want to draw it along an axis like a force because acceleration is not a force. I like using the little implies arrow to indicate an acceleration, and I always draw it up in a corner a well away from the rest of the free body diagram just as a notation to remind me of which way something might move. Now that you have all that information, we can define the direction for plus and x and plus y on the axes. You want to use the direction of acceleration as the plus direction unless something in the problem tells you otherwise. The most important thing is if you've got more than one body is to be sure your choice is consistent. So each free body diagram has a consistent definition of the positive direction so that the acceleration comes out to be the same number and the same sign for both pictures. If there isn't an acceleration in the problem, your choices are pretty much up to you, but be sure you define them clearly so the plus direction for each axis is on the diagram. Now you draw the forces. If it's along a coordinate axis, just draw the arrow and label it with its name. I always draw those first. If it's not, draw the angled force lightly, then draw its two components with a dark, bold arrow or a similarly dark dashed line and label the components. We're going to use the components, not the force itself, so we want to be sure we clearly label the components with their magnitudes. Sometimes it helps to cross out the vector that's been replaced by its components, but that's not required in my classes. Our textbook gives a very good description of this process. Identify the object of interest, replace it as a dot, draw the vectors for only the forces acting on that object, tails on the dot. I really like that emphasis about on the object, so that we're looking at that body and that body alone. But he doesn't emphasize the key step that each force needs to be decomposed into components in your chosen coordinate system. That step 
needs to be done at the same time while you're drawing the free body diagram. If you do it that way, you'll get the correct equations quicker and more accurately than any other approach. Now you can develop, right, net force equals mass times acceleration for each body. That's, of course, a vector equation, but we want to write it in terms of the components in terms of the axes we chose. Once you've done that, it's all algebra and computing. Evaluate, assess, check plausibility. Are the units right? Does the problem want a vector as its answer or, or, or magnitudes or something else what we need? Okay, so one simple example, a common example. Incline plane, which is the first lab we do this in the semester. This is example 5.1 in our textbook, an example that ignores friction. But I've added some extra illustrations and modified some of those figures from the textbook to show the process. The example is a skier on a slope. There's motion along the surface. That's going to define our choice for coordinate system. The environment is the surface with its normal force, the force from the ground, and the earth producing a force of gravity pulling the skier straight down towards the center of the earth. That's the physical situation, the drawing of the problem. We can model that as a block or some just lump of mass on an inclined surface. And here I've annotated that to indicate that we do have a normal force that's perpendicular to the surface and motion that is parallel to the surface. And we have chosen axes based on that surface and that acceleration so that the x-axis is parallel to that surface. This is our model building process. The free body diagram, we then draw those axes, the x and the y. Notice the x on the right end indicating the plus x direction. Notice there are no arrows on those axes just a blob at the center indicating where the center of mass of our mass is, where the center of the skier is for that example. And I've got that little plus a vector up in the corner there to indicate that, yeah, that's the direction of motion. That's going to be my plus x direction. I want to really have that clear in my head because you can make big mistakes by messing that up. Then draw the forces. Here you see all of the ones that were shown in the textbook. But I start with the normal force first. Draw that arrow it's shown in red here. Notice gravity has got not along one of the axes. It needs to be decomposed into two components, the x part g sine theta, the y part that goes with mg cosine theta. Now we've solved the problem. You see, if we throw away the axes, you can see that there's two forces in the y direction, the normal force and mg cos theta, that must be in balance. The net force in that y direction is 0. And there's an mg cosine uh, sine theta, excuse me, that's unbalanced and is responsible for the acceleration along the x direction. You can see those in the picture. The equations are an exact mirror of what you see in the equation, where two forces add to zero, and the third force gives you ma. Okay, so that wraps that all up, and we shall call it a day here.